Okay, we will now call the Committee on Environment, Climate, and Legacy to order. Today is March 30th, uh, 2023, room 1150. Uh, let the record reflect that right now is 329, and we do have quorum. Thank you for all your uh, presence today. You know, a long, a long awaiting procedure, and so now we are on part two of the Part two doesn't mean necessary the language or anything. It's just the continuation of our um, our environmental um, budget omnibus bill, because part one was when uh, Mr. Stanley and Mr. Mueller and the agency go over uh, the bill, and so today we're going to members going to dive down and we're going to have discussion over the bill. So I'll pass. I'm going to move over to the table and uh, pass the gavel to my vice chair, who now will be chair of this committee, Senator McEwen. Good afternoon, Senator Herr. Um, I believe um, we have um, a technical amendment, the A12. Uh, members, this yes. amendment should be in your packet, and I, it has also been posted online. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, procedurally. Um, um, we are taking Senate File 2438 as amended off the table. And now, Senator Hur, to your technical amendment. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ma Madam Chair and members. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank all of you for your work in putting together the Environment Budget Omnibus Bill. And uh, while it doesn't go nearly as far as I and other progressive members of our caucus would probably like, it is a good bill. It fully funded our agency, which allows them to do the important and much needed work to keep our air, water, soil, and land clean and healthy for all Minnesotans. This is a bipartisan bill. It includes several provisions, chief authored by GOP members. This is a physically respons responsible bill there's no new fee increases, and I urge for your support, members, of this bill. Uh, we do have an amendment um, coming up, and I motion that we adopt that amendment. Um, I don't have a copy here, but I believe it's, is it A2 or A1? A1. Thank you. It's the A, I, we have it as the A12, A12 Senator Herr. And if, um, yes, I believe our uh, fiscal analyst, Dan Mueller, can walk us through the, the amendment. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members. The, the A12 is a technical amendment, just a few things in the bill to clean up. Um, the first thing on line 1.3 is uh, extending one of the appropriations within the DNR for the peatlands, and it's saying that it's available until June 30th, 2028. Uh, this is something that they had originally requested but just didn't get in the bill. Um, lines 1.4 to 1.7 is just making sure that we have the right general fund base amount in the tails, and this reflects the numbers that are in the spreadsheet. Uh, line 1.8 and 1.13 uh, puts the, the correct name reference to the Minnesota um, the, the commission that's in the bill and adds the word regional in it to the, to the Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails Regional Commission. Um, and then Lines 1.10 and 1.12 again adds the correct base amount in the out years um, for the general fund in the Parks and Trails Division. And again, that number reflects what's in the spreadsheet. 
Thank you very much for that run through. Um, okay, um, Senator Her, it looks like uh, we don't have any testifer, testifiers signed up today. We have some written testimony that has been submitted. Um, but we do have the agencies or representatives from the agencies here. And at this time, with um, you're okay, I would like to invite them to come up to speak um, to the amendment. Um, okay. Um, and we can adopt it first. Okay. Well, Senator Hur, um, I'm being told procedurally what we'd prefer to do is go ahead and adopt the A12 technical amendment first, and then we can go to any testifiers. Is that um, acceptable? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I move that we adopt uh, the amendment A12 uh, to the Senate file 2438. Thank you, um, Senator Hur. Senator Hur moves the adoption of the A12 amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay, the amendment passes. All right, um, now I uh, will then go ahead to um, ask if any of the representatives of agency, the agencies who are here um, would like to offer any additional testimony um, or comments to our bill as amended. I would invite them up. Okay. Uh, it looks like we don't have anyone additional to testify. So, Senator Her, with that, uh, we can go ahead to, and move to uh, discussion amongst committee members. Um, would you like to make any comments before we move to discussion? No, I really I re thank everyone already, and uh, I'll definitely will thank again, you know, later um, as we motion this bill to pass to of the finance committee, but. Um, accepting question to, to this bill and um, also you know want to hear proposal you know other proposal from members if there's any um, and uh, you know I know the agency are here and uh, be ready for me to call on them on on the subject that is related or amendment that's related to, to their jurisdiction very good thank you senator her um, with that members discussion to the bill as amended. Yes, Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think what I'll do is probably ask a couple questions now and then wait and see if other people have because I've got a series of them here. Uh, and I'll, if it's okay, Chair, her, I will ask you the question and the appropriate agency can come up and answer it if you'd like. Uh, so on, uh, on page three of the bill on, on 3.8, and I looked it up and maybe I missed it, but uh, it says 106,000, uh, first year 109,000, second year from the environmental fund for duties related to harmful chemicals in children's products. Uh, I'd like them to explain to me what those duties are. Um, Senator Herr. And I believe that's MPCA. And if yes. we have... Um a uh, representative from MPCA who could join Senator Herr at the testifier's table to address Senator Green's um, question. We would appreciate it. And uh, Welcome. Madam Chair, I'd like to re defer to Mr. Kadoka for this question. Very good. Thank you. Could you please introduce yourself uh, for the record? And we look forward to... Um, um, and appreciate very much you joining us to address these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. For the record, my name is Kirk Adelka. I am Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. The provision you're talking about are related to the Toxic Free Kids Act that was passed at, um, about 12 to 15 years ago. It's work that the MPCA, along with the Department of Health, works on, on identifying chemicals and their requirements and statute that need to be done, including updating of list and education on various types of chemicals. And that's something that we do jointly with the Department of Health. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so yeah, so just to be clear then, you've got about 200, well, roughly $215,000 to just continue to update what you already know. Uh, is there any, any process, do you, are you digging in to try to find new, or are you just updating lists as they come in? 
Thank you. Chair and, and committee members, there are a number of two lists that need to be updated and reviewed over time, and there are also ongoing requirements for education, so it is a ongoing activities for both agencies. This is part of the work we've incorporated into an interagency team called the Chemicals and Products Team that helps us make sure that we're coordinating to do this work. Follow-up, Senator yeah. Green. Uh, well, thank you. Just a comment, and this is, this is one of the things that I've been looking at for a lot of years, and it seems like what should be just your common everyday duties at, at the agency always comes with an extra cost besides what you've already got in your base. So, um, but that, that you answered the question, I guess, so thank you. The next question I believe is for Bowser, and uh, it's uh, from page 443, starting at line eight on the bill. You got $15 million uh, to restore peatlands. And if the, if the peatlands have been, if peat has been removed or something's been destroyed, what is the process for Restoring them because in our area we call them peat bogs. Uh, most of the time, if you can't mine the peat, all that grows there is weeds. And so I'm just wondering what the what the process for restoration on that is. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Her. Madam Chair, I'd like to call Bowser to come and explain to Senator Green on this. Uh, Senator Green, can you uh, reiterate what line is? It's on uh, 43.8. If we uh, the have. DE3. They, if we have a representative here from Bowser, if they could please join us um, to address um, Senator Green's question, we would very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. If you could please uh, answer, or, uh, uh, identify yourself for the record uh, for us, and uh, thank you for offering your expertise to help us answer questions today. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrea Fish with Bowser. Thank you, Senator Green, for your question. Alas, I am not the subject matter expert on peatland restoration, and what I'd like to do is get some high-level detail for you from the folks who work with peatlands in our agency and provide that back to you. Thanks. Senator Green, follow-up? Uh, yeah, thank you. Could I get that very soon? Because pretty soon this is going to come to the floor, and $15 million is a lot of money. I'd like to know what's going to go into that, so I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Green. And um, if um, Ms. Fish, if you could send that information to, I don't know if all the committee members would like to have that, but I, I know I would like to have that as well. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, follow up, Senator Green? Uh, no, thank you. I'll let somebody else ask a question and I'll dig out the rest. Very good. Members, any further discussion or amendments um, for Senator Herr? or our agencies about our bill? Any time. Yeah. Yes, Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have an amendment for the bill also. Um, should I come up and present it now? Would you like to... Um, well, isn't, isn't, it isn't for this particular amendment, but it's a different amendment to this amended 126-page bill. I'm, I'm sorry. Could you I have, please I have, restate I have, that? Senator? Yes, I have an amendment, the A17 amendment, it, but it doesn't have anything to do with his amendment. So should I wait till we vote on his? Uh, oh, his amendment. I'm sorry. Your amendment is the bill. The, Never mind. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, his I'd like was to a technical amendment from earlier, um, and we did adopt that, and we have already adopted the A3. Um, so okay. is this to the A3? No. Or so the, this is. I would like to introduce the A17 amendment. Okay, to the bill as amended yes. right now. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. Senator Wiesenberg is um, offering the A17 amendment um, to Senate File 2438 as amended. Um, while this is being passed out, Senator Wiesenberg, to your bill or to your amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So this would um, ask for. So if you go to page 21, line 27, um, get there, please. This would amend it where it says six million dollars the first year to re put it down to five million seven hundred thousand, and then on page twenty six, line four at the end, uh, we would ask for three hundred thousand dollars for uh, looking at and here's what it says three hundred thousand dollars for the first year to prepare an analysis of an alternative sources of water to the, resolve the water use conflict in the Little Rock Creek area. So in Benton County, um, there's a Little Creek watershed and. 
uh, from my understanding, the DNR has been working with stakeholders in the area in the watershed district to come up with a plan that supports the environmental health and those who are using the water. Um, and I, this did pass the environmental um, committee in the House also. So, thank you. Thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. Um, Senator Herr, to the A-17 amendment. Uh, Thank, thank you, um, Senator Wiesenberg, uh, for putting this bill up. I, one, 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 part, I, one point I forgot to make right at the beginning of this uh, committee is that I'd like to hold the line on our budget and uh, also try to um, listen, but I uh, want, want to make sure that we don't sway too much on taking uh, dollars from other uh, bucket to, for for us. Some, in, some, some of the uh, amendment or interest source. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to hear um, from DNR on, on this standpoint first and also get a advice from our um, fiscal analysts if need to. Um, Madam Chair. Yes. Members, uh, for the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. Senator Wesenberg just uh, shared this amendment with me earlier. It did come up in the House. Uh, our concern is that this, the dollars are coming out of our base appropriation from our ground, groundwater management account. You'll see on, on lines 21, um, page 21, 21.28 to um, 22.11 outlines the activities that we use those dollars for. Uh, well, this work is needed to be done, and we are working through that groundwater management area group. Um, it will have impacts on those other in activities that we have. We did testify in the House to the fact that it, 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 the work needs to be done, but we, we do not support the funding source that's there right now. Okay. Um, any further comments to the A-17? Yes. I just had a question for Assistant Commissioner Meyer. I, I know you said you testified on it in the House. It's my understanding that they did adopt that amendment when they were going through their omnibus and it, so it is included in their bill now. Is that correct? Assistant Commissioner Meyer. Uh, yes, but they are, it, it is in there for now. We'll see if it stays in there, but they are going to try to work on that funding source as well. So, Follow-up, Senator Eichhorn? Members, any further um, comments um, on the A-17? Yes, Senator Hurd. Ma Madam Chair, I just, you know, I mean, um, although it's been proposed in the House, you know, and then we have procedure here that we hear bill, you know, I know that we couldn't hear all of the, all the, all the bills and, and then put into, uh, put into the anonymous bill. I, I also want to hear folks that are, are testified in support of this so that we, we, we get a, a Transparent perspective, whether I, um, whether I accept it or not, I, I'd like to get that front. You know, in addition to Senator Wiesenberg. Okay, um, Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this was given to me today, um, but I do know a little bit about the background in that area. Um, I know they're, we're just trying to work with the people there to do what's best for them and the environment. So um, I, I do like Senator. Uh, hers uh, thoughts of maybe trying to hear from someone from the other side too. So how do we proceed with that then? Um, thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. Senator Herr, uh, we can take a vote on the amendment, um, but I don't know, do you have any thoughts or? I just wonder if there's anybody in the audience that will speak in support of Senator Wiesenberg's amendment here. That's that is an point. excellent question. Uh, if there is anybody here who can offer testimony about this A17 amendment, uh, we would like to hear it. Yeah. Welcome. Please identify yourself for the record. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Tony Quillis and I'm representing the Irrigators Association of Minnesota. And as Assistant Commissioner Meyer and um, Senator pointed out, this is an area we've been working with the Department of Natural Resources on, specifically up in Little Rock Creek. It's very familiar also, you've heard some discussion in this committee about what uh, eastern uh, suburbs, White Bear Lake, uh, Woodbury, um, Lake Elmo uh, situation that's going on there. So this would 
provide the DNR to be able to go back and do some studies in that area there. I think the discussion is, as Mr. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Meyer pointed out, on the funding source. I don't think that the policy of them being able to do that, it's the funding source and trying to work their way through that, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, yes, Senator Herr. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I appreciate Senator Wisdom for bringing this amendment forth, and I'll look forward to work with him af after this committee, but at this time, because of the sh short notice and not, 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 not enough information, it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, amendment that come promptly without my knowledge will not get accepted, but uh, there's there's some detail that I need to iron out, and I'd like to uh, ask that, you know, we um, we vote no on this amendment uh, for now, and I'll look forward to work with you. Senator Wiesenberg. Sure. Just take a quick pause. Yes, Senator Kunish. And Senator Herr, I, I hope I'm not um, interrupting your flow here, but the bill, um, or the, I'll, um, the amendment, um, the reason is to resolve the water use conflict in the Little Rock Creek area. And the Little Rock Creek area um, looks to me to be pretty extensive. Um, if we're talking about the Little Rock, Little Rock Creek that I know, it starts, it's, it's, it goes for miles and miles and miles. So I'm a little curious um, where exactly the water use conflict is and what are those water use conflicts and where, uh, and then below it says negative impacts to water, uh, groundwater use. So I'd like to maybe get clarification and this could also um, help Senator Herr um, when, he does, when he talks about this later on, but um, if somebody could answer what are the conflicts, the water use conflicts, uh, where exactly in the Little Rock Creek area is it, or if it's the entire creek, or and then um, what are those negative impacts due to groundwater use? Thank is you, there Senator. anyone that can answer that, those questions? Thank you, Senator Kunish. Uh, yes, uh, Assistant Commissioner Meyer. Madam Chair, Senator Kunish, this area is uh, an issue dealing with groundwater and impacting trout streams. We have a groundwater management area there. We've been working for several years with stakeholders on trying to come up with solutions to that rather than just deny irrigation permits into the future. Uh, it's not going to be, a, we don't want to get into a first in, first out, last in, first out type situation. So um, there is a website that we have. Uh, a web page that goes over the, the entire issues that are there, and we have a 40-page study that's also on that that I can share with members as well. Um, we've been meeting with them since 2016 with residents, permitted water users, and local government leaders to, to discuss, analyze, and plan for the sustainable and continued use of groundwater in the area. Uh, we've developed the action plan I discussed. This work is part of that action plan. It also relates to the, the sustainable diversion limits language that you're carrying, Madam Chair, uh, that's part of this conversation as well. So we're trying to figure out how do we get the individuals the water they need without over-appropriating the groundwater and having impacts to, to designated trout streams. Is, uh, follow, uh, is yes, that follow up, Senator Kirsch? along the entire creek all the way through, or are there specific areas? Assistant Commissioner Mike? I'm trying to find a map, Madam Chairman. Um, It's really focused in just in that Little Rock Creek area. Um, I, I, maybe right. Senator Wessenberg knows the, 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 the square mileage of that area. I don't have that available with me right now. Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do believe it's more in the southern half of the area. Um, I can show you if I can look at that one after I'm done speaking. But I would like I would withdraw my amendment also, and we can speak about how we can move forward with this. Um, I do know, though, with uh, irrigators, um, there's technology advancing where they're able to not use as much water also as we're going forward and how they can spray nozzles and put it right on the field and we're using less water that way too. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Senator Riesenberg. Senator Riesenberg is withdrawing the A-17 amendment. Uh, thank you for the discussion and it sounds like it will continue offline. Okay, members, further discussion? Yes, Senator Green. 
Can Assistant Commissioner Bob Meyer come right back up? <laughs> Assistant Commissioner Meyer, you are invited back up if you would like to uh, join Thank us you. again. Yes, Thank Senator Thank you, Madam Green. Chair. Uh, Assistant Commissioner, I, I know we, we had uh, done a joint meeting of the House and Senate a while back, and in there there was testimony given about some of the statistics on CWD, and I and I know that if you if you averaged it out, it was like 0.16 percent of the of the tested deer tested positive for CWD, and then in uh, in the last year they they. Uh, greatly multiplied the number of deer that were tested. I don't know exactly where they were tested, but it, it, it uh, increased slightly to 0.2%. So the numbers are very low. And also in that same uh, um, meeting, we, we learned that in the last year, there were zero CWD in the deer farms. And, uh, and so a while back, uh, when I was in the house, we talked about uh, maybe using the deer farms as a uh, test test plots uh, to see if we could uh, maybe uh, breed the the gene that was resistant to CWD, and I don't see any of that in here. I do I do see a lot of language that is essentially going to put these guys out of business, and and I personally think that that's uh, giving up uh, a great opportunity we have to actually get a hold on this. And so my question for you on this is, is the, is the DNR uh, and, and the university, I think it was Dr. Larson that, was, that I talked to on this, who was at one time in favor of it, are you exploring any of that to try to, in a contained area, actually study how the disease moves and if it can be uh, eliminated? Assistant Commissioner Meyer. Madam Chair, Senator Green, that would be a question for the Board of Animal Health. Senator Green. Well, if they're here, I'll, I'll ask them too. Thank you, Madam Chair. But this is because the DNR is getting, taking over authority from the Board of Animal Health. This particular provision is under environmental natural resources. But if the Board of Animal Health is here, then I would greatly appreciate their input on it as well. Thank you, Senator Green. If there is any representative from the Board of Animal Health, we would like to invite you up at this time. Thank you. Thank you if you'd please, uh, welcome. Thank you if you'd please uh, identify yourself for the record. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. My name is Michelle Medina, and I serve as the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And in that role, I serve as a liaison for the Board of Animal Health as well. So yes, we have, as the Board suggested, that we could use deer farms potentially to do these studies to check to help determine if we can not breed out CWD, but see if we can breed animals that are less susceptible to CWD. So currently, we are not able to do this because in statute, if we find a positive on a deer farm or any farm surveyed farm, we must depopulate that entire farm. So this isn't possible at the moment. It would require more statute change to do that. But we do see that as a potential opportunity to look into more research to figure out the disease and understand better what we're working with. Follow-up, Senator. Thank you, Green. Madam Chair. That sounds like a good amendment for the floor. Maybe we can work on that. Uh, Madam Chair, another question, if that's okay? After you. And this, I think, would also be for Assistant uh, Commissioner, and this would be on page 69, uh, starting at line 25. Uh, there's a definition here of grasslands, and grasslands means landscapes that were formerly uh, dominated by grasses, and I'm assuming they mean their pre-settlement, which is pretty much all of western Minnesota. Can you tell me if you've, if when this is... Uh, gone in, if there's been any consideration what this might mean to the, the farm communities out in western Minnesota to have these new designations and, uh, and some of the new, uh, going along with some of the other uh, provisions in the bill. Madam Chair. Yes, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, Senator Green, that is a Bowser provision in the bill, not a yeah. DNR provision. Well, you're just shooting me all over the place. Is Bowser here? Yeah. <laughs> Our representative... Uh, Ms. Fish, or if there's another uh, representative from Bowser who could come to address that question. Thank you. May I ask Did Senator you hear Green? the question? Would you like it repeated? I would love it repeated. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Green, could you please repeat the inquiry? 
Uh, yes, Madam Chair. It's on page uh, 69, starting at line 25, and it gives a description of grasslands. And, and basically, it, it doesn't say it, but it, it, it looks to me to mean pre-settlement grasslands. And so that's, what, that's a new definition in there, in, in statute now. And have, has there been any consideration uh, or maybe even ideas of what this might do to the farming community? Because most of that land right now is, uh, is our agricultural land supporting nearly 30% of Minnesota's GDP. Uh, Ms. Fish. Thank you, uh, Senator Green. The definition of grasslands here is giving additional eligibility to enter into easement programs for grasslands that have not been converted into croplands. Um, so the voluntary, the option to enroll in the program with retired croplands remains, and this adds an opportunity for grasslands that have not been converted to croplands. Senator Green, follow up? Thank you. I'll have to reread that because I didn't really see that definition in there. But, uh, but thank you for that. And as long as you're there, we've got one more for you as long as this. And this is going to be my last one for the day until I have an amendment later. Uh, on, on page 81, um, it starts at uh, 8118. And it talks about the, the stewardship program, which we have a stewardship program, but this is, appears to be adding uh, a lot to that. And uh, on, on line 22, it says a stewardship organization producer must not maintain a financial reserve in excess of 75% of the organization's annual operating expense. And I'm trying to even figure out what that means. Can you explain that to me? Um, and I believe that this may perhaps be a question that is best geared toward the MPCA. Um, so welcome back, Assistant Commissioner Kudelka. Thank you, Chair and, and committee members. Uh, again, the, the provision is about the paint product stewardship program. And so right now, the organization that is set in charge to take care and properly manage paint is allowed to put an assessment on paint. And you may see that when you go to the hardware store or the paint store. And so that money is collected in. What the agency's provision is trying to do is make sure that they don't have a reserve that can continue to keep growing. What we're trying to do is put a cap on it to make sure the fees, the assessment adequately reflects what is needed to run the program. So, for instance, we get a budget each year of how much they operate. What we'd want to do is that if their reserve is more than 75% of their annual budget, they would have to come in and make a change to their assessment to lower it because we don't want to just uh, continue to have their reserve continue to grow and grow if the fee can be lowered. We want to make sure that we're being very responsible with the, the dollars being charged on the sale of paint. Senator Green. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. And then, then maybe you can clear something else up for me because the, I think the the charge on the paint is a dollar a gallon, or at least it was when it was instituted. What the, what the new language is doing is, is going to require producers to, uh, to do the assessment or, of, uh, of how much they're, I suppose, selling and, and how much they're collecting. It's going to require them to uh, do reports and, and to come up with their own stewardship plan, and they get two shots at it, and if they don't and if the commissioner feels that it's not uh, appropriate, then he'll do the plan for them, as I understand it. So a lot of the language is new. And, uh, and so I understand that we collect the money for the paint. But uh, that, that, I think, is collected at the retail. And, and with this, now, if they don't have a plan, they can't sell paint in Minnesota. If the retailer doesn't buy paint from someone who or actually a retailer can't buy some from who doesn't have their own plan that is approved by the commissioner. So it's going to limit that. It's going to drive up prices. But it just seemed to me like this was separate and maybe above that, that simple charge per paint. But you're telling me it's the same charge. And, and so um, the dollar, where does the dollar per gallon go right now? Assistant Commissioner Kudelka. Uh, chairing committee members, that fee is collected by Paint Care, which yeah. is the product stewardship organization that has been established to take care of the program. The money goes from the retailer or them directly to the nonprofit organization. It does not go to the state at all. And so the 
state or just oversees their budget and wants to make sure that the reserve is responsible and is only at 75 percent and doesn't continue to grow. We've seen in other states the reserve grow quite high and what we're trying to do is make sure that doesn't occur here in, in Minnesota. You're correct that this is not a, a any different change or requirement for new plans for anyone to do. This is just their existing plan to put some type of cap on it to make sure that the assessment is a reasonable amount moving forward. So Madam Green. Chair, just one more thing then, because I'm still not quite getting what you're saying. Uh, in this uh, new language, it says a produce, producer or the sewer, stewardship organization must propose a uniform stewardship plan. So it's talking about the producer, and, and then it goes on, and you're telling me that the money does not go back into anything that the producer uses. So that all this is, is to the producer is the plan that has to be implemented by the commissioner, and then uh, where the, the, what I just read, the stewardship organization or the producer must not maintain a financial reserve. If this money is going into the stewardship uh, committee or whatever it was you're talking about, why is the producer who is not collecting and not keeping that involved in this? Assistant Commissioner. Uh, Chair and committee members, uh, thank you for the question. It, it is confusing when talking about producers or the product stewardship organization. The statute set up that individual producers could run a program or they could go together as a product stewardship organization. In Minnesota, all paint producers have joined what is called paint care. It's the product stewardship organization and they are the ones moving forward and doing the implementation of the plan. There is the option for it to be different but we don't anticipate anyone changing. They will continue to operate through paint care. That will all be the same. So there are no new requirements on the producer at all. They've all said that they will have the nonprofit paint care do the work on their behalf in Minnesota. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, members, yes, Senator Riesenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was, we were talking here about the Little Crack Little Rock Creek watershed. So I missed the first part that uh, Senator Green was talking about. Was that on page 50 with the CWD or what page were you on? Senator Green? I'll have to look it up again. <laughs> I just closed my book. Uh, the CWD portion starts on page 47, I believe. R I, uh, Madam Chair, I guess yes. my question, because I have a question about that. I, was it about, so my question is about the deer semen importation. Is that what you asked? I missed it because we were talking. Senator Green? Madam Chair, no. Senator Wiesenberg, my question was, has the, um, has the agency, whichever agency it is, uh, actually looked into using the the deer farms as a laboratory, I guess. Okay. And uh, apparently they would like to, but we need to change some statutes for them to do that. Senator Wiesenberg. Okay, Madam Chair, then I do have a question. So we did, uh, we did get some um, language in the bill, uh, page 50 on line 50.19, that says nothing in this section prohibits a person from importing survey semen from a herd certified as low risk for chronic waste and disease. Um, but we still have on the same page on 50.8 and 50.12 language that would contradict this. I guess maybe I would ask council um, if we still need to change the language in 50.8 and 50.12, if this would ever come up so we know that we can do this. Thank you. Mr. Stanley. Madam Chair, members, Senator Wiesenberg, no, this is fine as written. Um, this is pretty standard practice where you set out some requirements or prohibitions and then in a subsequent paragraph, you make it clear that those do not apply to certain things and that's what's happening on the lines you're asking about. Senator Wiesenberg, follow up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't sure. Thanks. Very good. All right, uh, members, any further discussion or questions? Yes, Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm going to have an amendment. I'm going to offer on behalf of Senator Lang, who isn't able to be here today. He's dealing with an issue in his district today. 
Very good. So I will offer the A19 amendment. Okay. Um, and Senator Herr, I'll talk about it for just a minute as they're handing it out here. It's based on a discussion we had in committee when we were talking about the uh, personal watercraft, motorboats, the, the licensing there. There was a discussion around um, allowing some exemptions for smaller motors. Uh, I think it was Senator Lang and Hoffman that were having that discussion, both about uh, 25 horsepower motors or less, or 60 horsepower on a pontoon. We did not include the pontoon language in here. This would just simply uh, say that if a, a, there's a motor with less than 25, 25 horsepower or less, uh, an individual may operate uh, that boat without, the, without having to obtain the permit. Uh, there was some good discussion on it. It seemed like there was, uh, you know, maybe some support to allow that. Uh, I don't know if you remember the discussion on it. I do believe Senator Lang is online at the moment if needed, uh, unless he's working on something in his district. But uh, again, there was some discussion around this, simply just policy. There's no other financial piece or anything like that to it. So if you've got any questions, I can try to answer. If I can't answer it, or I don't remember something about the discussion again, he might be available online for questions as well. Thank you, Senator Eichhorn, and we do have Senator Lang online, so um, 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 just, to, just for the record, we know we see you, Senator Lang, and um, if there is anything that you'd like to add, Senator Lang, about your amendment, um, um, please feel free. No, I, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity, Madam Chair. No, this was just... Uh, uh, something that had been in law previously, and I, I think it's kind of a, a shout out to those resort owners that have some of those smaller uh, boat rentals. And we, like Senator Eichhorn said, we had looked at pontoons, uh, and, and truthfully, I didn't have enough expertise to, to really make a decent judgment on that portion of it necessarily. I know that, uh, again, like, like uh, Senator Eichhorn said, we had a pretty good discussion. Um, and being that I think it offers just a little bit of an exemption for some of our resort orders and, and some of those boats that maybe uh, don't go quite so fast. So uh, ho hopefully it's viewed as a friendly. I think that was kind of the spirit it was drafted in. So uh, with that, I guess I'd stand for some questions. Thank you, Senator Lang and Senator Eichhorn. Uh, Senator Herr to the A-19 amendment. Thank you, Senator Eichhorn and Senator Lang for bringing this uh, amendment forward. Uh, you know, I'd like to remember this discussion uh, that we had with Senator Hoffman and Senator Lane, but I, my mind is blurred at, at that point. But I'd like to defer to Senator Morrison. I think this, this is under the Senator Morrison's bill. Um, Senator Morrison, do you recall? And what, what you want to, want to get your input first before I make my decision? Senator Morrison, and I'll note we also have the agency here if they um, have any input for this. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chair Her, and thank you, Senator Lang. I do recall this discussion. We never closed the loop on it. Um, so I might ask counsel to, There, I remember there was discussion about how, horsepower versus, <laughs> can you help clear it up for me, counsel? Madam Chair, members, Senator Morrison, I think the main issue here is that uh, under current law, if you are operating a motorboat that's not a personal watercraft that is 25 horsepower or lower, you currently can do that without a permit and without anybody else in the watercraft. And so what Senator Lang's amendment would do, or Senator Eichhorn's amendment, um, would be to preserve the status quo with respect to that. Senator Morrison, any follow-up or Senator Herr? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Hurd, do you? I would defer to you. Um, I want, was wondering if there's any advocates group in the audience um, who would like to testify would to like this. Would like to te testify on this. Okay, uh, Senator Wiesenberg, I will call on you. And if there are any members of the audience, including the agency, that have any testimony in regard to this A19 amendment, um, please join us at the testifiers table. Yes, Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I would speak in uh, uh, not opposition in in favor. Support. There we go. <laughs> um, I guess I'm getting ready for Easter already. Um, I know I grew up fishing, and I drove boats with small motors and, you know, my dad taught me how to do it in uncles and things. So, um, you know, he teaches, it's just part of our heritage and fishing and things. It's trying to let these 
kids go fishing, you know, so it's, it seems pretty not, you know, it seems it's good. So thank you. Madam Chair. If, uh, yes, if I remember right around the discussion along that is part part of the concern was you know when you get to the higher horsepowers the higher amount of speeds you know this is going to be more the kid that just wants to go out and go fish and they're not doing a bunch of wakes or anything like that they're not towing a tube this is just this is just the kid that's going to go out there or adult that's going to go out there and, and go fishing so it's much slower speeds and that's why they kept it to just 25 horse in the amendment. Thank you Senator Icorn and um, Senator Hearn we also have Assistant Commissioner uh, Ryan. Here. Uh, Madam Chairman, members, uh, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, DNR, once again. I understand the intent. I've been discussing this with our enforcement division, and we'd like to work with the author and Senator Lang and, and make sure that this is the right way, the right, right way to go. So I think at this point in time, uh, I don't see any harm right now. So. Okay. Uh, I will note for the record that I recall speaking about this with Senator Lang in the last couple of years, and I also grew up... Um, learning how to drive a very slow and small pontoon boat and fishing on our lakes. So I'm very sympathetic to wanting to make sure that our young people are able to continue doing that. Um, but Senator um, Hur? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and appreciate the, the amendment. You know, um, being that we only had a limited of time to make a decision whether to take it or accept it, and although this is a small provision, it's, it's, it's friendly enough, but we want to take precautions, so that's why we have uh, no longer discussion that need to, but I, you know, it, it appears friendly, so I will accept it as a friendly amendment. Okay, very good. Um, Senator Herr has indicated that he will he would accept the A19 amendment as a friendly amendment. All in favor of adopting the A19 say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the amendment is adopted. Members, further discussion. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if it's appropriate time, I'd like to offer the A20 amendment. And if it's okay, I'll uh, uh, explain it. Yes, um, um, to the A20, Senator Green. Thank you. And uh, Madam Chair and, and Senator Herr, on Friday, I wasn't able to be here in person, but I was listening on, the, um, on my phone as I was working. And uh, there was, an, there was a, a bill brought forward uh, for... Uh, a new type of uh, way to clean the water that didn't use chemicals. And it was brought forth by uh, Senator Jasinski, Jasinski and uh, it was from Senate File 2424. And uh, it was for quite a bit more than what I'm asking for here. It was for actually three projects. But I, I really think that, uh, that it was important to get this out there. We do a lot of... Uh, talk and, and we spend a lot of money on doing testing and uh, trying to use things to clean the water that aren't going to harm the environment. And this looks like it's been tested and tried. Um, it's my understanding that uh, somebody said that they thought this was going to be included, might inadvertently been left out. Uh, so what my amendment does, it, uh, it appropriates $75,000 uh, and it's going to come out of the resiliency account. And uh, if, you, if everybody's got the, the flyer in front of them, this is what this does. And, and I don't, I have to tell you, I don't understand the process. I'm not a uh, scientist, but it, uh, it looks like it's done with uh, infusion of oxygen. So there's no harm to the, the lake. There's no harm to the, the fish that are in there or any of the other uh, plant life that are there. But it does destroy the, the, nox or the weeds that we're trying to get rid of. And uh, so... You know, if, I, if there's any questions, I'll try to answer them. But when I heard it, um, and, and we have this, this problem in our lakes in northern Minnesota, it's, uh, it just looks like it's the right time to try this pilot, pilot project. If this works, this could be an amazing breakthrough uh, across the state. And obviously it does. So if it's okay, uh, I would like you to consider the $75,000 in the A20 amendment to proceed with this pilot project. Okay. Senator Herr. Uh, thank you, Senator Green. You know, by my mental algorithm, usually I s usually support the smaller requests, you know, with the, you know, in, in subtraction with the larger millions of dollar requests. But I, because we're taking money from, uh, you know, another pot, I'd like to, s I'd like to hear from the agency. I think you talk about the uh, dollar from, 
is that re resilient communities? Is that is that what the money yeah. that you're taking it from? I like to I like to hear, hear the the point of view whether taking seventy five thousand dollars from their budget whether that will be painful enough. Okay, um, would someone from the uh, the PCA please join us at the testifying table to Madam Chair speak to this? Yes, Senator. Well, well, they're coming up. Uh, the the amount that's in this is one hundred seventy three million dollars, almost seven hundred seventy four million dollars. And you know we're we're working toward the same goal, and I've, I sit here for year after year, and I've made the statement before that, you know we, we put money into study after study after study, and I just wait for the day when someone can come and say, you know we've got a conclusion, we we we've we've found something that works, and so far just this year we found one thing that that the university came in and said we have a breakthrough. And I was very happy with that. But this looks like another one here. And I don't think it's, you know, that we're not taking that much out of the budget when you've got $174 million. So I hope that you'll consider this. Uh, Senator Herr or our testifier from MPCA. Yep. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. For the, for the record, uh, Tom Johnson, Government Relations Director for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I. We're, we don't uh, necessarily oppose this, Senator Green. Uh, I, I would say um, the agency does not know enough about what this project actually entails. I'd love to learn more information on that. Um, we, this large amount of money that is in uh, for resilient communities grants is for cities, and so and that would be a competitive grant process. So I think we would encourage. Uh, you know, cities to go through that competitive grant process to receive funds. Um, however, I think we're open to, to discovering exactly what this project is and, and if it does provide the, the water quality benefit that, um, that is claimed there. So thank you, Madam Chair. Follow-up, Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. Here's your chance. <laughs> Here's your chance. You got a pilot program uh, that's taking a small amount of money and uh, and we've already got proof that there's some very good results from it. This might be the chance for, uh, for the agency to come in and say, yeah, let's test this and we'll watch it. Uh, a lot of money goes through here and $174 million is a lot of money. And in comparison, 75,000 is not. And I think it'd be a good use of the money and I, and I do hope that you'll consider this. Thank you. Any follow up, Senator Herr? Yes, just wanna see if there are any um, members that wanna speak and support this before I make my call. Okay, uh, members, uh, are there any other um, comments or on the A20 amendment or questions? Senator Madam Chair, I'll just speak in support of Senator Green's motion here. I do think, like you said, it's a, you know, it's a small amount of money and it's a great opportunity for us to try to start to scale this up and see if this is something we can use more statewide to solve a problem. I think his, his points were we're straight on. It's it's a small amount of money. Um, I hope that we're able to include it today. I know you know maybe it doesn't make it through conference committee or whatever, but it'd be great to have this in the Senate's bill uh, as a strong position for us to have for this going forward. So hopefully, as we go through the process, it can stay. I I, I do think it's a really great opportunity that that could be scaled to multiple lakes throughout the state. So, uh, being that it's a small amount of money, I would love to see it stay and and would would be honored to have your consideration on it. Thank you, Senator Eichhorn. Um, I would note that just for myself, I'd like to see more than, than this. This doesn't mean a lot to me because I, I know that, I, that, I mean, it doesn't tell me a lot about the water quality. I can tell that there's a lot of um, um, growth, <laughs> um, but depending on the season and what this lake is normally like, what its natural habitat is like, I don't, I don't understand what the pilot program is doing, um, so it'd be nice to have some more information. I mean, it sounds like it could be something really good. I just don't know what it would be, but um, that's just my own my own personal <laughs> comment. Uh, Senator Riesenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I do know that, I, I haven't seen this picture, but I do know what Loon Lake looks like from the top. My wife's from Wasika, so we go there and Loon Lake is like that. I haven't seen it look like the bottom picture, so if it did that, it's it works. So, yeah. 
I will chime in as well if I can. <laughs> Senator Acorn. We did have a, a, a hearing about this. That might have been the day you were gone where I chaired for a little bit until uh. you came back. I think that was the day we had it. So I know there's more information out there. Thank if you. I still have it in my office. We'll get it to you. If not, I, I do see the, uh, one of the individuals that helped represent it in the back, and he can probably get you some more data as well. But there was some additional data surrounding this that might help in your decision making. So Thank hopefully you. we can, I yes. see him out there. It looks like he shook his head and okay. we'll hopefully get that to you. Thank you very much for the clarification. I appreciate that. Uh, Senator Herr. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you uh, for allow members to have an engaged discussion. And I recall that uh, the presentation, it was you know, uh, very engaging and uh, mm -hmm. also appalling. It uh, makes sense. Uh, Senator Hoffman is one of the advocates for it as well. I know he's busy <laughs> that, at the time, but like uh, um, uh, it, after hearing from MPCA, you know, it's it's a you know it's a decision whether we want to make a direct appropriation or not, and it does fit in their agenda as municipal project, clean water, you know. Uh, so it pre, it bounced back to me as a chair to make decision whether. I want to make a direct, direct appropriation, and this amount is small enough that I, I would agree with the author, Senator Green. Take it that you will vote for this bill, um, the larger bill, the omnibus bill. So I, I accept it as a friendly amendment. Uh, Senator Hur, you're accepting this as a friendly amendment? Yes, ma Madam okay. Chair. Okay. Um, Senator Hur is indicating that he is accepting the A20 amendment as a friendly amendment. All in favor of adopting the A20, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. All right, the A20 amendment is adopted. Members, further discussion? Yes, Senator Housechild. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, Senator Herr, I appreciate all your work on this important bill. Um, I have an amendment that is similar to Senator Green's, um, the A8 amendment. Very good. The A8 amendment is being passed out to the A8. Senator Housechild. In uh, St. Louis County, uh, we have a precarious situation happening uh, with an existing waste site that is leaking leachate and PFAS into Lake Superior. Um, to address that concern, St. Louis County has come up with a plan um, to create a new waste campus uh, with updated technology to address the PFAS and leachate concerns. Um, and so with that, I would um, introduce this amendment, which would take funding to allow St. Louis County to plan, design, and construct one, one or more of these facilities to address the PFAS and contamination from landfill runoff currently within St. Louis County. Thank you, Senator House Child. Um, Senator Hur to the A8 amendment. Madam Chair, you know, I, I hope I didn't open a new can of a warm just accepting <laughs> Senator Green amendment here. But uh, I, I like to call um, MPCA to come again and talk talk about what, uh, maybe, maybe give, give us their thought first because this, this is a, a hard number here. And okay. again, I, I like to, you're gonna hold the line of budget, you know, but I'm open for s small consideration. On, Understood. On Thank you, Senator Herr. Can we please have someone from the MPCA up to speak to this amendment? This is a discussion on the A8 amendment. Welcome back to the testifier's table, Assistant Commissioner Kudelka. Thank you, uh, Chair and Committee members. Uh, again, for the record, my name is Kirk Kudelka with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. You know, just looking at this again, the type of work that's being done for climate change adaptation and that, that it's where the funding is coming from is much different than what is being proposed on the second part, which is for a landfill. Uh, so I just want to make that note very clearly that they are very different types of projects. On the piece two, just want to make sure and folks understand we, we don't have a leaking landfill and we do want to leave the impression that we have a leaking landfill in this area. We have lined landfills that are operating and um, you know, in that regard, we're you know, interested to learn more about the specifics of this, but uh, at this point, we'll just uh, leave it up to the committee. Thank you. 
Um, Senator Herr. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to seek council advice, especially on the physical note uh, from Senator, um, Mr. Mueller to see how that will impact since it's a large number of shifting. And um, after that, I do have another question for Senator House Chow as well. Thank you, Senator. Um, Mr. Mueller. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Herr, this it doesn't affect the, the, this amendment would not affect the overall spending in the bill. It's a $5 million carve out of the existing pot of money for the climate resiliency um, program at the PCA. So, it, but it would reduce the amount that they have to grant out to other um, grant uh, grantees. So in effect, it's, it's a bottom line, it's neutral. It doesn't affect the, the additional spending in the bill but it just reduces the amount that the PCA would be able to award grants um, out of this program. Um, yes, Senator Herr. Uh, Senator so Houcha, I wonder, have you um, have conversation with uh, MPCA on, on this or um, um, that they come to agreement? I, I hear that they are, you know, and somewhat supportive, but they are, did bring out the fact that there's no leak, 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 leakage um, so uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that before I make the decision? Senator Housechild. Th thank you, Senator Herr, for the question. Yes, we've uh, had conversations with the MPCA about this project with the county, um, and discussions are ongoing. That, that's actually uh, one of the main reasons why this is not an appropriation for the entire project. Uh, it's more for the planning and designing of what could be uh, a future waste campus site, given the concerns that there are with the existing site, um, and just the growing concerns for, for waste, both in St. Louis County, but also surrounding regions. So um, this is really just sort of an initial stage to help us get get where we need to be to, to learn more and, and uh, have some plans in place to address this issue. Senator Herr. Madam Chair, I, I would not hope to open this can of one too, too wide, and I, I question whether members have any bill that will target this pot of dollars, but I, I, I would uh, uh, be... Okay. Yes. Um, I, I, would, uh, I, would, I would support it, but I want to hear a voice vote from my members that we're all in this together. So. Okay. Very good. Any, any further discussion? Madam Chair, I support Senator Housechild's amendment. I do have a question about the fund that it's coming from in general, not related to the amendment. Should I wait until, should I ask that now or should I wait until after Senator Housechild's amendment is adopted? Uh, it's not relating to his amendment, it's just the fund where it's coming from. I got some questions about how it's being used. I do support Senator Housechild's amendment. I just process-wise wanted to know when you wanted me to ask that. I th thank you, um, Senator Eichhorn. I think now would be the appropriate okay. time. Let's have that discussion. I think it would be for the agency. Uh, I see there's 87 million there uh, uh, for local government infrastructure grants. I'm just kind of curious how some of that's being used. A, a few, few more lines down, it says for planning and implementing projects for adoption of climate change. So water infrastructure, the way I kind of think of Infrastructure is like if a city needs help with their wastewater treatment plant or their drinking water treatment plant. Um, is it going to be used in that type of way? Or is this going to be like for cities to say we need to plan to have more solar panels because of climate change? I'm just kind of curious how that fund, how you envision it being spent, just so I kind of got a better understanding of what the fund's for. Welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Frank Kolash. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Air and Climate Policy with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Thank you for your question, Senator Eichhorn. And understanding that this is a very uh, large request, what we are focused on with a significant proportion of this funding, uh, more about 83% of the funding we would want to target towards wastewater infrastructure projects, stormwater infrastructure projects, and other community-owned, uh, local government, tribal government-owned buildings so that they can be more resilient to the changing climate, warmer and wetter climate that Minnesota will have, more heavy precipitation events, uh, flooding events, and, uh, and high wind events. So it would, a significant proportion of the money is focused on building the resiliency in those types of infrastructure projects, wastewater treatment plants, stormwater uh, projects and locally owned, government owned infrastructure. We also have uh, a, about 
four uh, percent that's focused on tech providing technical assistance to the communities so that they can understand how they can use the most recent data and understand what their needs would be for that kind of infrastructure upgrade, how they can make sure that when they're applying for these grants that they're providing the, the best information available and being most competitive and being, being able to build the infrastructure that's most resilient to Minnesota's changing climate. Then we do have 3% for more community-led capacity building grants so that the communities themselves can be more prepared and resilient and understand what their needs are for the changing climate, be able to understand how they can inform then with their local governments and their tribal governments the needs that they have to be protected from the changing climate. And then about 7% would go towards the planning, particularly focused on climate resiliency planning so that communities can understand what they need, what their needs are, what their priorities are, uh, and also look at the potential building into design that it cannot be covered by other sources so that they are prepared to then go into the implementation and the build out of those projects. And these are all based on significant input that we've received from communities. We've surveyed communities for more than six years and all of them say that what they need is they need um, assistance and funding to do the planning. They need as assistance and funding to understand how to uh, build in climate resiliency into their projects, but then they also need the funding to implement the projects so they're on the ground and that their infrastructure is prepared for changing climate. Just a small follow-up, if I uh, may. Senator Eichhorn. So it sounds like my perception is right, that most of this is going to go into hard infrastructure, um, actual stuff, not just planning. So that I, I'm thankful for that clarification. I appreciate that. Um, would this um, kind of supplant or would it supplement maybe what... Uh, local units of government would maybe come to ask us for bonding for, or is this, do you see this kind of different than that? And I'll, I'll end with that as far as the question on this one. Thanks. Mr. Kolesh. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Eichhorn, we see this as uh, supplementing those kinds of projects because many times those kinds of projects are not, el the, the funding that they're seeking are not eligible to include some of the climate resiliency uh, design and construction pieces that would be necessary. So we want to be able to have funding available that would supplement those requests and ensure that they, these infrastructure projects that are being built and funded are prepared for the changing climate in Minnesota. So it would be a supplement to it. Okay. Thank you very much. Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this, I guess, would be a question for you, speaking of bonding. I was kind of thinking about that when you were talking, because I do have communities that don't have water and don't have flushable toilets, and they currently aren't included in bonding. So could they come to you to get aid through this grant program? Mr. Kolesh. Madam Chair, Senator Weisenberg, they, they could if the proposals and projects were focused on how they're going to also include the climate resiliency and preparing for a changing climate in Minnesota would be those kinds of projects. Those would be accepted in, in these kinds of grant process, projects that we're looking at. Follow-up, Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, while, I, while I do appreciate making sure that we're prepared for the future, um, we need to look at what's actually happening now to you know, we need to take care of people that can't flush their toilets and don't have drinking water. Um, that money should be spent there first before we're appropriating money to prepare for something that hasn't happened yet. So just, I guess that's a thought. Um, there are people that are in need of that money right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Herr or Assistant Commissioner Kolash, if you have any comment, please feel free to offer one, but otherwise we can... Um, move on to any other comments or questions. Ma Madam Chair and, and Senator Weisenberg, I, I agree, and, and I, that's what one reason why we were creating this was to uh, make sure that we are focused on what cities need, but then also helping them build in the future resiliency as well. So that's why it's a supplement to the other sources of funding, because sometimes those funding sources would not allow the coverage of thinking about and planning for a changing climate uh, into their, their budget side, and this would supplement those kinds of projects. Thank you. All right. Um, members, any further discussion? If not, um, Senator Herr. Madam Chair, I accept this as a friendly amendment, and if, we, if the procedure allows us to move, to move to adopt the amendment to the Senate File 24, 
38, uh, so it will move. Uh, okay, thank you. I can give it to Senator Housechild to make the motion. Okay. So move, Madam Chair. Very good. Uh, Senator Herr has indicated that he views the A8 amendment as a friendly amendment. Um, all in favor of adopting the A8 amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. The A8 is adopted. <laughs> Members, further discussion? Yes, Senator Housechild. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have uh, one final amendment, uh, the A3 amendment. Okay. I'm sorry? Yes, Madam Mr. Chair, Shanley? Senator Hauschild, the A3 is the DE, so I think you probably have an amendment to the A3. I'm sorry. I'm looking at the wrong spot. A16 ah. amendment. Thank you yes. for the clarification. That makes sense. The A16 amendment is being passed out. Um, while it is to the A16, Senator Hauschild. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is really a, a, a clarifying amendment in my eyes. Um, currently with the um, cumulative impact uh, piece to this bill. Um, most territory is exempt outside of the metro area. Uh, this just further clarifies that if a project has a permit to mine or is within the taconite relief area, it is not part of the cumulative impact analysis. Thank you, Senator Housechild. Um, while well, members are looking at this amendment, I think I'll first um, go to Senator Herr and um, then we can have some discussion. I, th I, I think I may have a question for um, the MPCA, if someone could please join us at the testifier's table as well for that. Um, but Senator Herr, to the yes. A16. Um, Madam Chair, I. My, my answer to this will be simple, but I want to reserve my answer to this until uh, I hear stakeholder first. Uh, and uh, I, I just would like to hear advocates and uh, maybe just one, one advocate that could uh, you know, elaborate this amendment for us because uh, uh, this, 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 the language here and this issue is broader than you know, um, what we can, what we know. And it does require further discussion that may take even hours to talk about this. So I'd like to hear um, expert agency as well as, you know, advocates, maybe one advocate to testify in support and why we should support it. Thank you, Senator Herr. Okay, um, well, I, I, I might go ahead then with a question for the agency, if I might uh, we'll get us started off here. Um, uh, my question is, um, I am curious as to whether the, whether the current cumulative impacts language in um, the bill uh, affects any of um, our mi the mining permits that have been issued. Thank you. If you just introduce yourself for the record before you answer, since we have a couple people up. Thank, Thank you. Madam Chair, Frank Kolash, Assistant Commissioner for Air and Climate Policy for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And um, if you could repeat your question, just to make sure that I answer it correctly. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I will repeat it, and I might have a follow-up, too, for, to for clarify. I am wondering if the current cumulative impacts language in the bill, um, and, and then I'm going to ask if there's any change. I guess I can ask it all at the same time. But I'm wondering if just currently as it's written, if that language would affect any mining permits. And then um, also, you know, the, the, that follow-up question then would be with this proposed A16 amendment, would that would it change anything in regard to the issuance of those permits? With the... 
My understanding, uh, Madam Chair, the current language, it, we are restricted to, to the seven county metropolitan area. And so those would not, we would not be implicating any of the. Oh, uh, sorry. And uh, Mr. Johnson reminded, and tribal lands. And I think we would have to look at specifically the, the within one mile of tribal lands. Uh, language as well, and that would be important for us to understand whether those are um, connected and whether these kinds of facilities would be captured by the one mile buffer from tribal lands. And um, I don't know off the top of my head, we would have to look at our, our maps of that we have for the tribal lands and then the locations of these kinds of facilities to determine whether or not they are implicated, but there's a possibility they could be. Thank you for that. Um, I appreciate it. So um, I'm hearing um, that you need to have a, a closer look at the map to, to give a, a more a fully developed answer there. Madam Chair, correct, because we do, the, the language does have the one mile buffer within it. We would want to make sure that we're not just eyeballing that off of a printed off map and an understanding. We want to uh, use the information that we have available, especially with the size of some of these facilities, to make sure that we understand exactly how they interrelate with that one mile buffer that's in the language. Okay. And then, uh, I mean, uh, could, could you... Looking at the language as it currently exists, exempting the metro and the tribes, um, in comparison to the amendment that has been offered, the A16, uh, which refers to the Taconite assistance area, does that, would this change um, that analysis at all? Is it still a map question? <laughs> Madam Chair, I think it would it, it would change our analysis and it would be about uh, very closely looking at the map because um, I, someone did pull that pull up the, the map of the, the Taconite Relief Area and it does uh, cover uh, a significant number of the counties and we would want to make sure we understand how that overlaps with then both the location and the footprints of these types of facilities plus the boundary in relationship to the boundaries for tribal lands. Okay. Thank you. Members, further discussion? Yes, Senator Kunish. Um, thank you. I have a question about um, on, uh, in, in the bill where um, it talks about within Indian country as defined by United States Code Title 18, Section 1151. And I looked that one up. And it says, all land within the limits of an Indian reservation under the jurisdiction of the United States, notwithstanding the issuance of any patent, um, including right-of-ways running through the reservation, all dependent Indian communities within the borders of the United States, whether within original or subsequent acquired territory thereof, or within or without limits of a state, um, all Indian allotments, the titles to which not have been extinguished, including right-of-ways running through the same. So um, I guess my question for maybe the author or maybe one of you folks, uh, first of all, do we even have the right to, um, to put these kind of um, laws or legislation in Indian country, recognizing that these are sovereign nations? And then uh, second of all, would this have any effect on those, those right of ways that um, they're running through the reservation, but, um, well, maybe just the first part about um, do we have those kind of rights to do this sort of legislation um, on reservations or telling tribes this? Any? Thank you, Senator Kunish. Before I um, go to our um, amendment author and our testifiers, could you just for my own clarification um, repeat the reference that you made at the beginning of your question and comment? Um, what was that? You, were, you read out numbers to a statute, and I want to make sure I know, knew what you sure. were referencing. Thank you, Madam Chair. And maybe this doesn't, it doesn't necessarily pertain to, but it could pertain to this amendment. Um, it's on page 92, and it is on 92.23, and it's the United States Code, so it's a federal code, 
Title 18, Section 1151. Thank you very much, Senator Kunish. Um, let's see. Um, to Senator Kunish's uh, question, do um, either of our testifiers from the agency have any response or reaction or per, are the amendment author? I'll just open it up. Madam Chair. Yes. Thank you. Please identify uh, yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Tom Johnson, again, um, Government Relations, uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, the bill itself uh, defines environmental justice areas and um, is not creating a law that would impose anything upon the tribes. In this case, um, to my understanding, and maybe council can, can reaffirm that, but there's uh, the, the section of the bill that um, covers this would actually be um, where we are uh, required to look within one mile of an EJ area. So this would be there, of course, we do not uh, suppose to um, cover air permits within um, reservation territory that is sovereign land, uh, but within one mile radius, uh, that would be where we would be looking at the cumulative impact analysis if it is uh, having an, a, an impact um, upon the EJ area as, and in this case, that would be tribal territory. Follow up, Follow up Senator Kunish. All right, so then um, if you, there's that one mile sort of buffer um, and in the, in the amendment, um, it's talking about um, does not apply to new facility or expansion of an existing facility by a person um, permitted to mine iron. So it's, it's um, I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering if there was anything, any noxious air or anything that came um, within that one mile parameter of a, um, of a, Indian country, and I'm not sure how to put this, make this conversation. So I'm wondering if this this um, amendment then would would make it so that if any there were any kind of pollution that would go into that one mile parameter of a uh, a reservation or Indian country, um, if they would still have the responsibility of um, addressing that pollution. Am I making myself clear? Madam yes. Chair, yes, uh, yes, Senator. Uh, the the if if the determination was made that there was an, going to be an impact upon the EJ area, that is that would trigger a cumulative impact analysis at the at the agency's discretion. We may require uh, a facility to do that work, and uh, the the point being that if there were that some of these areas, the environmental justice areas across the state, um, whether it be tribal land or whether it be in the metro area or, or any of the environmental justice areas as lined, uh, outlined by the bill, um, if they're experiencing disproportionately pollution um, from facilities, both historical and, and present, um, that we would want to look closer at whether to, to permit a new facility in that area. Okay, thank you. I'm finished. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Uh, at, uh, Mr. St Stanley, do you have something you wanted to add? Madam Chair, members, I don't know if this is a helpful clarification, but Senator Hostchild's amendment actually makes the effect of this language narrower. And so to the extent that you're concerned about the issues that you're raising, Senator Hostchild's amendment goes in the direction that I think you are you are going, Senator Kunish. <clears throat> the other thing I'll say is nothing in this language that's in the bill now seeks to sort of refashion the relationship between tribal authority and state authority. This is just saying what has to happen where the PCA already has uh, jurisdiction over the permitting process. It's not changing the relationship between the tribal permitting authority and the state 
permitting authority. Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, uh, Senator House Child, for offering the A16. I hadn't seen it until now, but as I'm trying to go through it, I think this is really good clarifying language that I think is important to add. So I appreciate you offering this amendment, and I do support it as well. And I hope Senator Hur, you'll be able to accept this as a as a friendly amendment for Senator House Child because I think it does. Um, help again give that clarifying language for folks that both Senator House Child and I represent. So thank you for bringing it forward, Grant, or Senator House Child. More form. All right. Um, and Senator Hur, I, I, I also have a comment, but I, I want to make sure if, um, of I'm course, sorry, I will give you, you the you last you comment, but do you have something yes. first before no, that? Um, you, you'll go first, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, um, Senator Hur. Um, um, just members stepping out of the role of um, chair that I'm temporarily stepped into here. Um, I have concerns about this um, for a number of reasons. I actually am disappointed. Um, I know that in your opening remarks, Senator Hur, you noted that some of us who are uh, more progressive um, may have wanted to see a stronger bill. That includes me. Um, I wanted to see the, cumul the full cumulative impacts um, implemented all around the state, and I was disappointed to see that um, the bill had already um, been compromised in the sense that it only applied to the Twin Cities and to the tribes, excluding my community of Duluth and excluding many areas around the state where this analysis is, is well, it's important for everybody. Um, one of the things that I'm very concerned about is um, the recognition of what cumulative impacts and looking at cumulative impacts represents and really means especially in the context of historical uh, environmental injustice and environmental racism, um, which we have experienced um, and experience in an ongoing way here in our state, um, not simply in the Twin Cities, and, um, but yes, especially um, in regard to our native nations and, um, and in our smaller metros like Duluth. So um, I, I am already disappointed that the compromise has been made. I see this as a further compromise that I, I can't support. Um, and I know that we have some fundamental disagreements um, in the Senate uh, about um, different lines that we are going to draw between environmental protection and public health protection and water protection and certain types of economic development and those debates will be ongoing. Um, but I have real concerns about this and at the very least I want to see some maps. I want to see how the Taconite assistance area overlaps with the tribes and the different areas that would or wouldn't come into play or would be um, screened out of using cumulative impacts as just one of the factors. And again, I just want to make sure that people understand for the record that the cumulative impacts analysis doesn't bar a project from going forward even. It's not a bar to any project, even a project that maybe that I wouldn't agree with. Um, but it is one factor that of course we should be looking at the cumulative impacts of a project when we are considering whether or not it is a good idea. Um, of course we should. And it's, it's surprising that we haven't had this in the law previously. So I feel like this is just doing some catch up here. And um, so I appreciate very much that uh, people are trying to do their best to look out for certain constituencies, but the cumulative impacts bill in my mind is looking out for Minnesotans that have all too often been um, either uh, taken advantage of or disregarded in terms of their health and their interests in their lands. And um, so th those are my comments. I um, regretfully can't support this without knowing more about the effects that it would have. And, I, and again, I wanted to see it be stronger in the first place. So with that, um, it, I, I also don't want to monopolize if there are any other comments that anyone else has about the A16. Otherwise, I will turn it back over to Senator Hurt and then also back to Senator Housechild for closing remarks. Senator Herr. Um, um, Madam Chair, I, um, I, there's two things here. One is the idea, the policy, uh, 
the concept. The other part is holding the protocol. And uh, we heard the legislation on environmental justice here in lengthy amount of time before we um, pass it over to state and local government. And they give ample time there to hear as well and make changes to the bill. Um, may not be to all liking, but there's change in, in there. Uh, and now um, we only spend a small amount of time uh, putting new amendment to it that there's just so much information out there that is still an answer to my perspective. Um, you know, climate change is real from my view, and we just we just recently passed a uh, renewable energy uh, policy here, and environmental justice needs to accompany that. Realistically, from my view, should be throughout our state, not you know cookie cutter a certain region. So, as chair and of this omnibus bill, I. All due respect to Senator House Chow, that's why I give ample time for us to have a little discussion on this, but it's not enough to change my mind. And so I would ask members to uh, not vote for this amendment. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hurt. Senator House Child. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, um, for your comments, and Chair Her for, for yours as well. Um, I know that there have been many thoughtful conversations around this uh, particular piece of the omnibus, as well as when it was its own bill under the authorship of Senator Champion. Um, you know, I, I am certainly open to, to further conversations among colleagues to address the concerns that have been brought up here. I, I know I have had many thoughtful conversations with Senator Champion. Um, this is, you know, this is really, I think, at the heart of, of our environmental policy, this discussion, this back and forth about what is the right amount of regulation? What is the right amount of addressing climate change? Because we know that that's real and a, and a pressing concern. How do we ensure that racial justice concerns when it comes to the environment are addressed? Um, and we know that the heart of this bill really was getting at air pollution in an urban environment in the core metro area. That's not to say that there are not other concerns across our state and that we don't need to look at that. I will say, speaking from my experience up in my part of the, the state, there are sincere concerns about our regulatory environment. There are sincere concerns about the length of time that permits take. Um, there are sincere concerns about projects leaving Minnesota. And that hurts our communities, that hurts jobs, that hurts families, that hurts real people. Just like environmental injustice hurts real people. Um, and so this is, a, this is a conversation that's worth having. And while I know many of us, it sounds like uh, not just by party, but kind of across regions may disagree on some of the, 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 the corners of these pieces of legislation. I think at its base, we can all agree we're moving in the right direction. And I'm, and I'm proud to support this cumulative impact legislation with some, some understandings for my region and where I come from and the people that I listen to on a daily basis. So I appreciate your consideration on this amendment. And, and Senator Herr, I, I appreciate you hearing this. Thank you, Senator Housechild. Okay, members, um, Senator Housechild uh, has moved um, the adoption of the A16 amendment um, on uh, to Senate File 2438. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say nay. 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 The A16 amendment is adopted. Members, um, further discussion or amendments? Yes, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Fong here, I just want to say um, I had about a dozen amendments for you that I was ready to go. I'm glad you're smiling looking at me and saying that. But um, this whole process, especially, you know, what we've seen in the last few weeks where, you know, you almost feel like it's the end of session and it's not. We still got a month to go. So there's a lot of time left to really talk about. And now it's it's a matter of taking the Senate position and going to the to the House with, with our position. And thank you for 
taking care of a few things, you know, especially the rough fish. You know, it was it was there, and and I know you and I, our, our battle goes back uh, ten years ago on the invasive carp, and I have uh, a, a piece of literature that I'm handing out to members. Uh, the staff are doing that just so you can take back and read with you because I think one of the things we missed, even though we're putting a little bit of money in that invasive carp. Peter Sorensen, who we've known for years, knows what is really needed. The research has been done throughout the years. And, and, and I, I'll, I'll tell this story, Senator Her, When David Tomasoni and I were looking at how Peter started, he was buying stuff from Home Depot. He was coming. He was really, you know, putting things together. And it, and it, it showed that there was a difference was being made. And I just remember the the little chicken wire that he had up at one time. This was 10 years ago, right? And and David Tomasoni saw that as it got clogged up. He said, well, that's a jobs creator because you can hire somebody to go in there and, and, and take that stuff out, right? Um, but but I'm setting aside some funniness, but the, the, the actual reality is that having where the dam is, if we would fully fund one-time money on that, Senator Herr, um, we have that built-in redundancy on dam number four and knowing the history that and the research that Senator uh, Her that Peter Sorensen has done, for him to say there's a 2% chance that invasive carp can get through dam five, a 2%, that's better than anybody's ever stated anything at all, right? Because if it gets through dam number five, we have the redundancy of dam number four, but you've you've almost eliminated, and it'll be the first state in history to do that. So I, I would hope as you're going through the process, you look at the house put $6 million, I think, investment in there, but you and I both know, we go back to originally in our clean water conversations, the last time we were in the majority, to even the discussions on the LCCMR and seeing what research has been done, what Peter Sorensen, he knows what's going on, right? And so I was, um, I was, I was uh, kind of blown away to see that we weren't able to find enough money. But if we do find enough money, Senator Herr, and I, I would really strongly encourage that we do, uh, we set a Senate position, but that's just a floor. It's a holding place. But I'd sure like to see us really um, uh, strike and fight for to get uh, as much. Can you hand these out to people here? Um, just to see that this letter that I'm handing out is, is Dr. Sorensen's research and the work that he's done that he sends to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife regarding the work uh, that's along the Mississippi River. So I just wanted to give you that bit of encouragement as you take this bill over that, that you do not forget about what we already know and, and that we do need some more money in there. I'm not going to pull up an amendment to try to do. I'm glad you were pretty flexible with Senator Green and Senator Housechild, but I do want to encourage that to you, Senator Hearn. I want to thank you um, for being open, for being accessible, and for really taking on what I think is a, looking like a pretty good bill. And with that, uh, Senator, thank you for all your work so far. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Housechild. Yes, Senator Hur. Senator Hoffman, duly noted. And uh, uh, as a uh, representative, as state senator, we can only do, do as much as our limit uh, based on information we got outside, whether it's lobbyists or advocates group. And uh, sometimes we're misinformed. You know, I've been um, approached by one of the one of the uh, lobbyists. Uh, just told me that oh, I should have lobbied much more. And there's also competition in in lobbyists as too. So at times we're not fully informed. And um, but I will uh, duly note this project as it move forward. Um, it's it's a work that we are um, in partnership together from the get go since 2013. So. Yeah, um, I, I commit to that. Uh, you know, so you know, I have not um, back on my promise that not putting funding. I did fund fund to it, but mm -hmm. maybe my funding wasn't not to the point where it's um, you know uh, satisfactory. But I'll thank you, duly noted. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Hur. And then one other thing is, we look at PFAS, and I'm, I'm glad we had the conversation on that. Uh, and I want to thank your staff. Um, I held off um, on a list because we know in the medical industry, in the world that I live in, the world that I work in, Senator Her, PFAS is part of AFOs, catheters, you name it, right? Um, carbon fiber work that is needed. And, and so I know as we move forward that there's going to be some more conversation. And I just want to make sure that, that we are truly looking at uh, the fact that, yeah, PFAS is, is harmful, but yet 
here's the but clause in, in this case in the medical world in these medical devices the the durable medical goods uh, it is something that is determining whether or not somebody's life is going to be of quality or if somebody's life is not going to be of quality and i just wanted to say thank you for uh getting your staff working with some folks that i know uh in the uh, in the world of that as you look forward uh, moving that so thank you for that again and thank you for this bill senator yes senator morrison Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to thank Chair Herr for his thoughtful and gracious leadership. This is a really good bill. You've worked very well with your diverse members and all of our different opinions and brought us together effectively. Um, it's a bill I think we're all proud of, and I know that I speak for all of us when I say we're grateful for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sen Madam Chair. If I yes, thank Senator, Senator, Senator Morrison. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and members, further comments um, for Senator Herr? Okay. Um, and um, Senator Herr, I echo those sentiments. Um, we, I really am, um, overall, uh, I think it's a wonderful bill, and I know that it's been a lot of work um, between you and our wonderful committee staff um, to, to produce a bill like this. So I thank you very much for your leadership on this. Uh, Senator Herr. Thank you, and I've been here again and again, and even from folks who are my mentors or uh, senior senators that were here before me, said that a good bill is a bill that you're not, you, you're not fully satisfied. So I think this bill is not a bill that I am fully satisfied, so are you, and we'll, we'll take this uh, bill to another level, to conferencing, to see where it go from here. You may be, we may still be at the same, um, a scenario, um, but you know, I overall, like you said, it's, it's a good bill. I'd like to thank all members, every single one of you. Uh, you make you make me look good as a chair, and so uh, um, my brother reminded, always told me that when someone tells story, then they become the protagonist of that story. So all of you are protagonists in this committee in your own right, whether. You know, based on the old movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, whether you're good, bad, or ugly, you're the protagonist <laughs> in this community. And so I thank all of you. I also want to thank the council, um, Mr. Mueller, Mr. Stanley. I also want to thank our staff, uh, Kara and uh, um, Mike Howe, and also our researchers yeah. from both sides of the party uh, there, and also our page as well and our testifiers and you know, folks in the audience against our agency uh, for making this hearing uh, uh, smoother than we um, had anticipated. So I'd like to ask that we move to, um, we move to uh, pass uh, Senate File 2438 as amended uh, and be, be, be recommended to be referred to the Finance Committee, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Herr. Uh, on Senator Herr's motion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. The motion carries. Thank you, thank you Senator Herr. Uh, thank you, everyone. And Madam Chair, you may adjourn the meeting. The Very committee. good. Thank you, um, everyone. The Senate Environment, Climate, and Legacy Committee is adjourned. <laughs>